Welcome to our James Wood Speaker Series. We're very delighted to see so many people and uh, I'm sorry that we don't have enough seats, but please feel comfortable to sit down during the, the talk. Um, I'm sure that uh, even if you can't see the speaker, it would be worthwhile just to be hearing what he, need, what he uh, has to say. Uh, this is James Rubright and he's the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Rock 10, one of North America's leading manufacturers of paperboard container board, and consumer and corrugated packaging. In the 10 years of Rubrite's leadership, Rock 10 has undergone a transformation to become the most profitable company in the industry as measured by ROS, return on sales. Before joining Rock 10, Rubite served as Executive Vice President of Sonat Inc., a diversified energy company headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. Prior to 1994, he was a partner in the law firm of King and Spalding, which happens to be right here in Atlanta. Uh, he, in 2009, he was named as the first ever Global CEO of the Year for the Forest Products Industry by Rezi, the leading information provider for global forest products, Executive Paper Maker of the Year by Paper Age, and one of the 50 most powerful people in the global pulp and paper industry by Rezi. He received his bachelor's degree from Yale College and a JD degree from the University of Virginia Law School. Please give uh, James Rubright a uh, Clayton welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I am uh, honored by your uh, welcome and by the number of people who are here today. I want to make a few opening comments, the first of which is that I'm going to join you with my coat and tie off. This is great uh, to see. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to do a couple of things today. Uh, the, the first one is to really address the subject that uh, I feel most competent to talk about, which is the development of a strategy for a corporate enterprise that will work uh, in a manufacturing environment in North America today and accrete value to shareholders independent of business cycles. Now, I've been asked to talk about strategy, so this is, I've thought about this a lot. Uh, my ideas evolve over time because I'm really looking backward, seeing a pattern in what we did. But I am not an expert on corporate strategy. I didn't go to business school. I've really only had one crack at developing a corporate strategy, the one that we're implementing today. So all I can do is simply tell you what we did. And I'll talk about the, the company that I joined, circumstances that we saw, what we thought about, what we reasoned out, and what we did and how it worked. And from that, I think you can draw parallels for your own experience and draw your own conclusions about strategy, which can be applied not only to corporate strategy, but strategies for life and strategies for individuals in their careers because Rock 10 story is really a story of overachievement. And as I talk about the Rock 10 that I joined compared to the Rock 10 to, that I, I, I go to today, I think you'll get that picture. And in a sense, as a story of overachievement, I think that it's something that can apply to all of us here. Uh, if, you, if you listen to what you heard, you get an idea of me that really is not completely accurate because I did go to Yale. Yale is a fancy school. I understand that. But I grew up in a family where my father was a mechanic. He worked on heavy construction equipment. Uh, he did not have a college education. Uh, the high school that I went to in southern New Jersey sent less than 10% of my high school class to any college at all. Uh, and so my background wouldn't indicate a basis for the career that I've had. So I feel that in many respects, my life has been a life of overachievement, and it's been a life of overachievement, I think, through a commitment to a set of values and a set of basic principles that we can all employ, and that I hope that that's the reason that you're here today, which is to understand how it is each one of us here can be the overachiever. The fact that you're here in this school tells me a lot about you and encourages me with respect to the opportunity that you have really to overachieve. 
The second thing I want to do today is talk about my passion, which is manufacturing jobs in the United States. It describes, to a certain extent, the environment in which a manufacturing company is challenged to succeed in America today. And talk a little bit about the economic environment and the, simply the numbers, what those numbers imply for manufacturing in America, and what those numbers apply, imply really for our society. Uh, if you think of the wealth creation in the United States, in really the late 19th century, the early 20th century, America emerged as the world's richest company, country. And it did so because it built an industrial base and an agricultural base that was unmatched in the world. And so we became the basis of food production for a Europe which endured two world wars. We became the manufacturing base for the equipment that essentially allowed two countries, England and Russia, to fight certainly the Second World War and survive a period of time. And that industrial base simply distinguished America from the West, rest of the world. And it is industrial jobs, manufacturing jobs, that in fact create wealth in a society. And they're quite challenged in America today in the environment in which we operate. So it's tough to do two things, but I'm going to try to do both uh, in the course of the next, oh, say, 40 minutes. As I do it, I, I want to ask you uh, a favor, and that is, uh, at any time, if you have a question, let's please stop and address your questions. My, my hope today is that I can be of some use to you and as much use as possible, and therefore, if you have questions, by answering them, I think I can make what I have thought through and the experience I have as valuable as I can to you. We will also, I'll leave time for questions at the end, so if, if you don't feel like interrupting or you think it'd be most appropriate to ask questions at the end, you'll have an opportunity to do so. I'm not going anywhere, so you don't have to worry about running out of time, although uh, we may, <laughs> it may not be the problem, I hope it is. Uh, and really, no questions out of bounds. I mean, we can, it can be something that I've talked about here, or it could be something you just would like to ask some guy uh, who has experience in corporate America today, and it can be personal as well. I mean, I don't, nothing's off the table if he's just like, okay, why you? How did you follow the path you chose? It's, it's all fine. Uh, so I hope that you'll do that. Now, you know, there's a statement that a picture's worth a thousand words. I really disagree with that. I think they're worth about a million words. So <laughs> I brought some pictures. So here's some pictures of Rock 10. Um, the upper left-hand corner of that page is a container board mill. It's actually one paper machine in a container board mill that is the lowest cost, most profitable container board mill in North America. It's located outside of Syracuse, New York. It's a non-union mill, probably the only non-union mill that operates in the United States today. Uh, unbelievably efficient, effective workforce, great technology. If you want to see the world's greatest technology, you can go to Syracuse, New York, you can go to China today. And that's a picture of it in the upper left-hand corner. In the upper right-hand corner is another paper mill, and that is a, a bleached paperboard mill. And if you have a Breyer's ice cream container, haagen ice cream container, Edie's, uh, any number of ice cream brands uh, in your refrigerator or freezer, that paperboard was made in Demopolis, Alabama, ultimately taken to a folding carton plant, probably in uh, Joplin, Missouri, converted into a folding carton, printed, cut, glued, shipped off to a manufacturer where it became an ice cream carton. We make uh, about 20 billion folding cartons a year. If you think of a folding carton, you get a Crest toothpaste, you take it out of that box, that's a folding carton. If you buy a cereal box, that's recycled paperboard made out of 100% recycled fiber. We make a zillion of those things. So it's basically packaging that serves food producers, consumer non-durable producers in the United States. And then corrugated packaging, which is essentially a brown shipper to a high graphics container. So if you go into uh, Office Max and you buy a printer off the shelf where the high graphics package is part of the point of sale for it or a club store or anything like that where you need protective packaging as well as a container, it's probably going to be corrugated so it's got a liner on the outside and a fluted medium inside. That's a picture of a great looking box plant right here. 
uh, that plant's in Devons, Massachusetts. And then a folding carton, again, that biscuit box, cereal box, toothpaste box, Federal Express, overnight mailer, a uh, zillion things is made here. And this is a great looking folding carton plant with two very large, very, very high technology uh, folding carton printing presses. And this is located uh, in Conway, Arkansas. So that's, that's what we do. We just do a lot of it. Now, uh, this is our geographic footprint. And Rock 10 uh, has 90 manufacturing locations across the United States. In Canada, we're a large manufacturer of folding cartons in Canada. We operate in Mexico, Chile, and Argentina. But if you look, the concentration is clearly starts in eastern Canada, comes down the eastern seaboard of the United States, runs basically underneath the Appalachian Mountains, and then back up the Mississippi River Valley to St. Paul. So why that? Well, that's where food and consumer non-durables are essentially processed and packaged in the United States. So we're located close to our customers. Most of those plants are converting facilities or folding carton plants, corrugated box plants. And the paper mills are basically located close to people because we make recycled paperboard. So you need to locate where recycled fiber is generated. So when you think of, uh, everybody here has to have been in a grocery store at 11 o'clock at night. Well, somebody's in the aisle of that grocery store unpacking a corrugated box, taking the cereal boxes out of that corrugated container and putting them on the shelf. Well, that corrugated box goes out the back door, goes into a baler where it's compressed with others into a half-ton bale of uh, corrugated packaging. That bale ultimately ends up in a paper mill like the first one I showed in the upper right-hand corner where it gets recycled and made again into paperboard. So you locate them in cities. So we're in St. Paul, Minnesota, Syracuse, New York, Battle Creek, Michigan, outside of Philadelphia, PA. Virgin paperboard mills, you put where there's trees. So the one on the upper left hand, upper right hand corner, that big bleach paperboard mill, which is a virgin substrate, that's in Demopolis, Alabama. A lot of pine trees, a lot of hardwood trees, and so therefore you cut down the transportation cost of your raw material input. So that's our geographic footprint, and we got a lot of people. We employ, uh, employ about 10,000 people, manufacturing jobs. About 84, no, maybe 8,700 of them are in the United States. In the state of Georgia, there's over 1,000. In Atlanta, we have about 400 people in our corporate headquarters, uh, and about another oh, seven or 800 manufacturing employees here in various locations in the state of Georgia. Now, our employees, when I go speak to our employees, I just feel like we're, we're right here, right? Because these are people from Utah, Alabama, Harrison, Arkansas, Greenville, Texas. We all have names you recognize, just the wrong state, right? Greenville, no, it's Greenville, Texas, okay? <laughs> Utah, it's, it's Alabama. I mean, that's, that's where we operate. And uh, why I'm so passionate about manufacturing jobs is that in my tenure, we've closed 35 plants. Well, an average plant for Rock 10 has about 200 to 250 employees, some of them as large as five or 600. And if you have a manufacturing plant in Green County, Alabama, and you close that plant, which you have to because you simply, that's what you have to do today for our company to survive, there's no job for that person there that is equivalent to the manufacturing job that they lost. We can do the math. Uh, uh, an employee in one of our plants making $20 an hour, 2,000 hours, that's $40,000 a year. But many of the employees in our plants are the single person in their family who has health care insurance. A lot of times it's a woman working at night, so contributing to the support of the family, but the health care for that family is the health care that we provide. The average cost for us to provide health care to a family is $19,000 a year. The employee pays 20% of that, we pay 15. So in fact, we're not paying $40,000 a year, we're paying $55,000 a year to that employee in Utah, Alabama. If we lose that job, what does that person do? Right? What job is there? If it's in the service industry, I know what a Waffle House cook makes, $7.20, 35 an hour, that's a minimum wage job. That may be the best job available. Right? So these are critically important jobs, and when you vote, and when you think about what it is 
I need to be doing in the United States, I'd ask you to think about, let's try to make sure we have manufacturing friendly policies that enable us to have jobs that are very high value jobs that we support and encourage. And again, I'm gonna show you some data that is not gonna be very encouraging relating to the manufacturing environment in the United States. Okay, let's just, let's just make this a, a, a business case. I don't know whether you use the case method in the business school here or in the undergraduate or in the graduate school, but basically I'm used to learning from cases, all right? Well, we're just gonna make Rock 10 the case. So Rock 10 uh, was founded in the 30s by one man who owned a couple of small box plants in 1964. His daughter married another guy. He was living in Florida, she was living in Maryland. He said, I ain't moving to Maryland. I'll go as far north as Atlanta. He moved to Atlanta and that became the headquarters of Rock 10 Company. The company was probably worth about $5 million when I first heard about him in 1972. By 1994, when the company went public, it was worth about 400 million. So this guy and a partner he brought in created about $395 million in value and they did it borrowing money buying cast off assets from large corporations that were shedding them and installing highly entrepreneurial management teams and letting those management teams succeed. And that was a fantastic strategy because they borrow, they borrow five million to buy this, it'd be successful, then they could borrow 10 million to buy the next one, pay that back, they could borrow 20 million to buy the next one, and it was a succession of growing acquisitions but the key to their success was this very decentralized, very entrepreneurial culture in their plants and their system. That strategy worked great in the 70s and 80s. In the 90s, the strategy lost its place in the economy. So when I came to Rock 10, I came at the end of this period, September 1999, this is a graph of the stock price performance of Rock 10's equity traded on the New York Stock Exchange from its initial public offering date in 1994 to September of 1999 when they called me and said, would you come in uh, uh, to Rock 10 as, as CEO? And as you can see, the company managed to create exactly zero value in that period of time. Now, uh, I had no experience in paper, forest products, or manufacturing. I'd been a lawyer for 20 years doing large corporate transactions. I had then left and went through a series of jobs in an energy company, and so I'm kind of an unusual choice. But the board that hired me didn't want anybody from the industry because the industry was basically full of unsuccessful companies, so they were essentially saying, we wanna break the mold and try to find a solution that we know we won't get if we hire an experienced person from our industry. They knew me, and they basically were willing to say, if you can develop a credible strategy, we'll follow it. I took the job because it really sounded fun, right? Because I had a chance, I knew, to do just what we said. If I could develop a credible strategy with a management team, these guys knew me well enough and had invested enough in bringing me in that they'd have to give me enough time to see if it would work. So it was an immediate opportunity to get what I've always lived for in life, which is a scorecard, okay? And that's a critical thing in measuring your progress along the way of life, is to have your own internal scorecard. How am I doing relative to achieving my goals? Now, uh, this is the funny part about taking this job. When everyone knows that you don't know anything about your job, and you're in a highly visible position because it's a public company, you're gonna get a lot of advice. And I got a lot, all right? And so here's some of the advice I got, right? Well, this first one was, look, you own all these paper mills. These are terrible things to own. You really want to be a packaging company because a packaging company is going to trade at a higher multiple and therefore your stock price will just go immediately up if you essentially tell the world you're going to be a packaging company. So we're going to package ourselves as a packaging company, not a paper company. That primarily came from the institutional investment analysts who follow public companies and publish research on them, but that was, that was absolutely clear to them in the direction we should go. I had one director 
say, well, you know you're high cost. We have to be high cost because we're not making any money. So just tell everybody that works for you to cut their cost by 10%. And just see what happens, right? Just make them cut their cost by 10%. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, the, an, another very, person very close to the company said, look, Kimberly Clark was an enormous success. They sold all of their paper mills. They kept their tissue mills, and they kept their consumer tissue business, and they've made a fortune. So let's follow their model and sell our paper mills. Chesapeake just did it. They sold all their paper mills. They're investing in folding carton plants. We can do the same thing. It, it's, it's, it's really like, it, isn't it obvious, because everyone's doing it, that this is the right strategy? Okay, well, we'll think about that one, too. Then clearly, no one wanted to spend any money investing in the business, because this was an underperforming industry. Clear people were not returning their cost of capital in the paper and forest products industry. So for goodness sake, don't spend any money on your business. Conserve your capital because you don't return your cost of capital on your investments. Like, OK. And then, of course, I get not only do we have an institutional investment analysts at the brokerage firms who publish research on us, but then we have the investment bankers who make their living doing transactions, whether it's securities offerings or mergers and acquisitions. And of course, they call on public companies every day. So I have a stream of very bright, very highly compensated Wall Street investment bankers coming through whose essential pitch is, of course, you want to be the consolidator in your industry because if you consolidate your industry, you'll improve the economics of your industry. You'll get larger, and that will be ultimately your path out of the predicament you're in now, which is you're trapped as a relatively small company in poorly structured industries. And I was like, okay, got that one. But and then last but not least was, look, you got to go global. The U.S. has very poor demographics, very poor growth in your basic industries. There's great growth outside the United States, particularly in Asia. So you really want to go outside the United States. Let's start and focus on China and uh, Europe. There are lots of acquisitions, and you could point to companies that were doing that. So it was another opportunity. And in fact, the global demographics are far superior to the demographics in the United States and we make packaging and so if you you know packaging essentially is going to grow with the population so these are not like ideas that you can immediately dismiss all of them have an element of truth it's true our industry was not returning its cost of capital it is true that in a consolidated industry you'll have better fundamental economics it's also true that uh, Kimberly Clark had been successful we were high cost Right? All these things had a, gra a grain or a foundation of truth. Well, they had a problem with all these ideas. And the problem was they didn't address our problems. Right? They were running away from our, our problems. They weren't solving them. And in fact, here was our problems. We were a high cost producer in a commodity business. Well, in a commodity business, your, your price that you can charge your customers is simply a function of supply demand and ultimately the right side of the cost curve, that is the highest cost asset, is going to set the price for your products and it's going to set it at the point at which he just stays out of bankruptcy. Right? And the low cost guy is going to make whatever the spread is between his cost and the high cost guys, but the high cost guy is always going to be on the brink of bankruptcy. Well, we weren't the highest cost, we were this guy which meant we weren't making a lot of money, but we were there. Right? Second, we lacked scale. Okay, we had a lot of $25 million folding carton plants. We couldn't invest in all of them. They weren't big enough to be really successful economic units. And so we had to find a way to, to get out of that box. Secondly, as I mentioned, this company had been built on a wonderfully entrepreneurial culture, but it was very decentralized. Well, business in 1995 was not business in 1975. Technology had empowered decision making. It had empowered people to do things on a much more efficient, centralized basis. And it had really changed the, the, the skill set and the mindset that it took to be successful to be a general manager of a folding carton plant or the general manager of a paperboard mill. And in fact, it was too big a job for any one person to do. So they need to be supported in a way that our company historically had not thought either necessary or appropriate. And in addition, we had to find a way to leverage our scale. So we had to have centralized purchasing to, to use our leveraging as a large corporation to actually optimize the price at which we were buying every input we had. 
And that was a difficult thing to do from a challenge standpoint because you had a lot of people who thought they had their own domain. And I got that point uh, conveyed to me very clearly uh, early on when I had just gotten there. I, I did a tour of plants. I went to see a lot of plants. And I had gone to this little plant out in Stone Mountain, uh, Georgia, and toured with the general manager. He was very nice. And as I left, I mean, I'm the CEO of the company. As I left, he said to me, he said, now, Jim, I want you to know you can come to my plant anytime you want. <laughs> I thought, well, that's really nice of you. <laughs> Thank you. But that was the mentality. This was his plant. So I liked that, right? I don't want to destroy that man's belief that this is his plant, that he's responsible for it 24-7, and he's got to make it successful. So he's invested in it. But by the same token, we've got to take away from him a lot of decisions that he thinks are critical. Where he buys stuff from, what price he pays, what his environmental compliance program looks like. I've got to offload a lot of stuff so he can focus on what he needs to be doing, which is optimizing the production in the plant. Right? And similarly, he may think he's got the greatest way in the world to set up a cutter, but by the way, it's taking you an hour and six minutes, and they're doing it in Baltimore, Maryland in 46. Right? And the economics are a lot better if it takes you 46 minutes to have this enormous piece of equipment down than an hour and six minutes simply to change jobs. So you have a really significant cultural issue that you've got to try to address, and you've got to balance the time frame over which you do it and who you keep and who can't stay, because people are going to have to change. And as you know, people really don't want to change. Okay? You have to make them want to change, and only some people are, are really capable of doing that. Now, the next thing was poor decisions were just killing us. In other words, we'd have two plants that would make $200,000 each, and then we'd have one that would lose $400,000. And 200 and 200 minus 400 is zero, right? So it was. And it, this just happened to me all night. And, but essentially, the organization had not done what it needed to do, again, to support its people. So we had to address that issue. And again, that was a cultural change and a change that required installing systems and, to a certain extent, changing some people. And then lastly, globalization was a major issue, but it wasn't our need to go there. It was the fact that they were attacking us. Everything we make, they make in China, Korea, Vietnam, Europe, Brazil, Chile, all over the world. And it can get here on a ship, highly economically. And a lot of the things that we make in the United States were not being made here anymore. So the need for the packaging was being destroyed. So about half of our businesses were shrinking pretty rapidly. So we've got a bunch of issues. And then lastly, there's the cultural issue. Because what you want to get is people committed to being so much better than everybody else that you can actually succeed. Right? And therein, if you're me and you're trying to think, well, how do I do this? You've got another problem. There's a fellow, I don't know how many people have heard of Jim Collins, but if you're a reader of business books, you're going to know a guy named Jim Collins. He wrote a book called Built to Last. He wrote another one called uh, Good to Great. And then the last one they just wrote is How the Mighty Fail. And this is a book about great companies. And what he did was he studied all the companies in America to try to figure out what was a great company, what did they look like, and who were they. And the bad news was he figured out there were only eight of them. Okay, so there's eight great companies in America. Well, we're rock 10, right? We're number 100 and, you know, 1,411 on the Fortune 500 list. Uh, we're not very profitable. We make packaging, you know. How, how am I going to go to people and say, I want, you know, we're going to be a great company? And the central thesis of his book, apart from everything else, was that you have to have this motivating principle for people. And the best example is, is General Electric, GE. We've all heard of GE. I was young when it was on TV. You may not have heard this, but it was a central part of their, their sort of value proposition was GE, we bring good things to life. Okay? Right? I mean, if you're an employee of GE, you can feel really good. Like my job is I bring good things to life. Okay? Well, that's really cool. We make folding cartons. Right? We make, we make brown box corrugated packaging. So how do you deal with that one? All right, well, I was very lucky. I was very lucky in my life because when I got out of law school, I went to work at King & Spaulding. King & Spaulding is a law firm in Atlanta. It's a big law firm if you know it now, but when I went there, there were 44 lawyers. And 
we thought we were the best law firm in America. And we were going to be a national law firm, very successful, very profitable, and we were just going to do whatever it took to get there. We were going to work together, and we really thought we could do it. Okay? So I knew what it felt like to work in an organization that sort of ignored the fact that it was small. I mean, in 1970, if you were from Atlanta, Georgia, you were from the South, right? So the people in the North pretty much had a prejudice against you to begin with. But like that was OK with us. And in fact, that place was very successful, achieved its goals. And I left with that knowledge of what it really felt like to be in an organization that just thought, we're committed to being great. Okay? And when I went to, to Birmingham and worked for this pipeline company, again, it was Southern Natural Gas Company, one of the smaller <laughs> pipeline systems in North America. Everybody there thought this was the best company in the industry. They just thought, man, we do it right. If it, and they were very profitable. In fact, that belief in yourself translated into commitment and high performance. So when I got to Rock 10 and thought about it, I thought, well, I'm not going to let Jim Collins define what a great company is for me. right? I know what a great company is, and there's a heck of a lot more than eight great companies in America. We can be a great company. We just have to focus on getting people to believe it and then understanding what it is that will make us great. So this, I'll give you the current value, you know, our value proposition or our statement. And uh, it's a little easier to articulate it in hindsight. You know, I've been through this quite a few times, so this is a, maybe it didn't look quite like this when we started, but the, the essence of it is there, okay? So I start walking around to these folding carton plants, that, small, unprofitable, located nowhere, and I, stay, I say, we're going to be the most respected company in our business, right? Now, why is it that I pick that? Well, I've always worked with people who had a high degree of self-respect. And I believe that the best people in America don't really work for money. They need money. You have to pay for money that they ultimately, on their fairness need, meter, kind of gets you there. But that's not why they work. The best workers in America work because the guy or woman next to them is working. Right? They're working for that person's respect. And by achieving that person's respect, they're achieving their own respect. So I wanted people to understand that, to understand that's our culture. We're all about respect. And I felt like that would be a coalescing principle that people could understand. And we're a small company, but that's an achievable goal, right? We don't have to say we're going to be GE. We don't have to be the biggest company in our industry. We're just going to be the most respected, and we're going to be the best company in our business. So what do we do? We think about, well, how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing is we're going to say we make packaging, and we make paperboard. But we're just going to make the best packaging and the best paperboard of anybody. And we're going to measure that by the satisfaction of our customers. Because in order, if, if we're really the most respected company in the industry, there's going to be three things that are going to tell us that. First one is customers are basically going to want to do business with us. So a customer is going to think, if I just had Rock 10 as my supplier, I'd have the best supplier in America. So you've got to have very high customer satisfaction. And we can identify what it is that's going to give you that customer satisfaction. And we're just going to commit to deliver that. The second thing is, if we want to be the place that every employee wants to work at. So if you know that the people who are working at your competitors are thinking, if I could just work at Rock 10, I'd have a great job, you're going to get those people. And you're going to get the people you want. Because you're going to get the people that understand this is a performance culture. If I go there, I've got to work hard. If I'm successful, I'm going to be very happy. If I'm not successful, I'm not going to be there. And there's a lot of self-selection in life. right? The people that don't want to be held accountable are going to self-select themselves out of that organization. And the people who want to be successful, right, who are willing to be challenged, are going to come. And over time, that's going to have a material transformational impact on your organization. But you're going to attract the people that you want. And you're going to lose the people you don't want. The next thing is, I don't care what you say about the fact that you don't return your cost of capital in your business. We are not low cost. We've got to be low cost. So even if we have the best customers, I mean, the best employees in the industry, if we don't give them the assets that will enable them to be successful, 
they won't be successful and therefore they won't stay and we won't be fulfilling our commitment to them which is you can come here and you can be successful and you can take pride in, in your success. So right through the recession, I walked into this job just into the teeth of a recession, right? I came the end of 1999. You all are old enough to remember, I think, 2000, 2001, the world came to an end. You have a severe economic downturn. Everybody in the world is wondering what to do, but certainly we're not going to spend money, not us. We're spending capital expenditures substantially in excess of our depreciation. And what are we doing? Well, we're not pursuing growth, right? Everybody knows if you're going to be successful, you have to grow your business. Well, if you can grow it profitably, that's true. We couldn't grow it profitably. We had to get to be low cost first. And so the, the principle I established, and people looked at me like I was crazy, was look, we're going to let our businesses right size themselves, but we're going to make what we can make money making. Right? And so we're going to take the cost of our production down by investing in technology. And there I was really lucky because, in fact, there was a lot of technology out there that had not been uniformly employed across our industries that, in fact, took cost out. If you replaced the 1988 printing press with a 2000 printing press, the 2001 ran 60% faster, it made ready in half the time, and you had a third of the startup waste because of the fact that the computers brought it up to color in a different way. So over a 10 year period of time, we have converting, converted our printing operations from essentially the 19th, 20th century art of printing to 21st century science. And we did that basically throughout our operations. Now, I don't want you to tell you, I want you to think that this is necessarily an easy thing to do or that you're looking at a guy who's necessarily a hero. Because here's a statistic. In 1999, we had 8,400 employees and our revenues were a billion four. So think of that, 8,400, a billion four. Ten years later, we make the same stuff. Now, there's been shift, some shift in mix. We sold plastic packaging. We increased our exposure to corrugated. But basically, we're doing the same things we did before. We own paper mills and we make stuff that we either sell out of the paperboard or we convert it. Today, we have 10,000 employees and we have $2.9 billion in revenues. So 8,400 is to a billion, is to a billion four as 10,000 is to 2 billion nine. Guess what? Along the way, we had to dramatically increase the productivity of our employment base. We had to increase the scale of our facilities, which I've said is a challenge. So we're closing facilities. We're putting those facilities together. And you, so you, it's very fair to ask me, well, how do you square that with your, you came here and you said, I'm passionate about saving manufacturing jobs. And yet, along the way, you got 10,000 employees, but they're not the same 10,000 as a lot of those 8,400 you started with. In fact, probably out of that 8,400, there's probably 4,400 of that 84 left. And the answer is, I can only save the jobs I can save, I can only create the jobs I can create, right? Because I'm going to show you a chart in a minute that shows what happened to the people that adopted other strategies. But we have those 10,000 jobs. And you say, well, is that fair? Okay, employee X loses a job, not fair to that person, but employee Y gets a job, right? So it may not be fair to employee X, but it's fair to employee Y, right? But the fact is that if you are faced with a lot of really lousy choices, you've got to figure out which ones are we, will, which ones are we, are we going to take and what are we willing to do to be successful. And my view was what I'm willing to do is create and sustain as many jobs as I can and this is the only path that will allow us to be successful. And it's the path we followed. Now, I talked about other things, which is a lot of it is maximizing our processes by uh, uh, taking economies of scale. If you're going to take a business school class, you're going to read about GE, and GE has a very, very simple ethic. And the ethic is, if we can't be number one or number two in size in our business, we're getting out. Right? We're not going to be in a business where we're not number one or number two. Well, I think we're the seventh largest manufacturer of corrugated packaging in North America today. That bleach paperboard mill I showed you up on the side, I think we're the sixth largest manufacturer of bleach paperboard in North America today. 
We also happen to be the most profitable manufacturer of corrugated packaging in North America today, and we're the most profitable manufacturer of bleach paperboard in North America today. So I didn't accept somebody else's definition of the rules and what it takes to be successful. But what I believed was that it's not the size of Rock 10 that is going to determine whether we have economic power. It's really the efficiency or scale of our operations. So instead of looking at our system, we're going to look at what is an efficient economic unit within our business. So if a folding carton plant needs 100 million in sales, we're going to take all these $25 million folding carton plants that we've got and we're going to consolidate them and we're going to end up with $100 million plants that themselves are compelling economic units. And that we have embarked on that and that is the reason why a lot of jobs that were in one location are now a job in another location but we have very successful plants in the places where we have economic units of scale. Well, the last one up there is you've got to systematically improve your processes, you've got to reduce costs throughout your company. So that was the whole notion of supporting people, taking some decisions, some functions away from them, supporting them with superior systems and processes. So for example, uh, purchasing is a great example that we've centralized in Atlanta. Uh, you actually have a, a graduate of your school who's one of our supply chain people. We have a, an intern who's in our supply chain from your school. I know you have a great program there. We use it, we think it's very effective, but it's the kind of job that manufacturing needs. And it's the kind of job that's gonna end up in a city if you wanna to happen to live in a city because it's a centralized function. I don't know if you've heard of Six Sigma, but it's a, basically a discipline that has a lot of good things about it. It's a very powerful process improvement discipline and methodology, but more importantly, it's based on database decision making. So if you go back to that earlier chart where I said bad decisions were killing us, we need to solve that and make good decisions. We've trained about 350 people, so that's three or four for each one of our operating locations in the Six Sigma methodology. And these people, when they're finished with that training, have an entirely different skill set than they've ever had, but that skill set is based upon database decision making. It's a very, very powerful methodology that has basically solved a lot of the recurring problems of mistakes that we had in our company. And those are just two examples. There's a lot of others, and I could, I could go on really for a long time on it. But basically what we're doing is systematically optimizing everything that we do and applying technology to allow us to do it. If you, if you take Rock 10 today, when I started, the stock price was about $14. Uh, when I left the office today, it was $47 and some number like that. It's a very substantial return. About half of the value creation over that 10 year period of time is the base business. So the legacy business that we started with, even after shedding about half of it, the half that's left is worth about twice as much as the whole was when we started. The other double comes from acquisitions. And so as I said, this company was based on, on acquisitions. It had an acquisition ethic or value principle that had stopped working. And it was interesting because not only did I get a lot of advice when I got to Rock 10, but there were two questions that I was asked. The first one was, what's your vision for the company? And my answer was, to that one was, well, I, I just got here, you know, can I have a little, <laughs> little time? And then if generation, I've done a lot of work on generations, because if you work with people of different generations, you really have to understand the way they see the world. Well, my generation is not the vision generation, right? So it's just like, I'm just never going to have a vision. But we did have a set of common values that I've talked about, about how it is we're going to make this company be a great company. But the second question was, what's your next acquisition? And my answer for a long time was, the next acquisition is none. Okay? Because we can't look for an acquisition to make us successful when we're not successful. The first thing we've got to do is get good at what we do. And when we're good enough at what we do that we can think about acquisitions, we'll do it. So for about five years, we did a few small bolt-on acquisitions. Really, it was an opportunity for the team to train, figure out how to do it, how to execute a transaction. Uh, frankly, we made a couple of mistakes, so it was, well, let's, let's try to do some small ones, and if we screw up, let's learn from it, but we're not going to bet the farm until we get it down. And after about four or five years, I felt like, okay, I think I know what we need to do to really make this company uh, like better than we can make on our own. And so we came up with an acquisition strategy. And, I, you know, again, for the people who've taken the business classes, who've been in business school, 
you're going to know a fact about acquisitions, and that is about two-thirds of all acquisitions that are done destroy value to the acquirer. They are unsuccessful, indeed, sometimes spectacularly unsuccessful. Uh, best example I can think of is uh, Time AOL. Transaction only cost Time $150 billion. Uh, but I could go on as a very typical example. So you got to thread the needle if you're going to do an acquisition and be successful. And we're going to do the acquisitions with cash, and we're going to borrow the money so we don't have the luxury of failing. Right? We're not an LBO firm doing 10 deals, and if we get seven of them right, we're rich. I can't go bankrupt. Right? I can't make a mistake. So we start out, who do we want to be? We want to be a great company. We want to be the most respected company in the industry. So we're only going to buy really good assets that make us a better company. We are not going to be Mr. Fix-It, taking other people's casts off. So we're going to buy good assets with good people. If we have to pay up for them, that's fine. We'll pay a market clearing price, but they're only going to be really good companies that make us more of what we want to be than we are today. The second thing is we know we're going to have to pay a market clearing price. So the guy who sells it, he's fine. We've got to make money. So we have to be very disciplined, and we have to find transactions in which we can really create value. So the strategic rationale for the acquisition, the synergy that we can create, have to be very clear to us with a path to execution that's going to create value in the transaction. That's a limiting constraint, because there ain't a lot of deals that are going to fit that mold. And it means you're not going to transform yourself overnight, because you cannot buy something in a totally different business and create value. Right? It has to be related to your value. So if you want to transform yourself, you have to do it iteratively through a series of steps. So it constrains your universe of opportunity of deals that you can do. Next thing is, if somebody, if somebody wants to pay more than you think it's worth, you just have to pass. So we've done two highly transformational acquisitions. We've looked at 10 or 12 and bid on three or four right to the limit of our dollar amount, and we didn't get them. But it's like, okay, you have to accept that fact, because the only way you can thread that needle and be in the one-third of successful acquisitions is to be disciplined and adhere to your value proposition. And then the key is if you look at our acquisitions, they've all been successful. Well, they met the first three criteria, but here's the way to be successful in an acquisition in our business. Is you have to figure out which people you want and then you got to figure out how to keep them. Because ultimately, people are extremely important. And in our case, they were very different. In the first of the two large acquisitions we did, the management team didn't like us. They didn't want to stay. They weren't very good anyway. <laughs> the big mill that I showed you in the upper left-hand corner, the general manager of the mill had cancer, and it was a pretty good chance he was going to die, which he did. He had ossified his team because he was relying on people to help him manage through the fact that he was in a terminal period of his life. So we, knew we needed to replace that management team. But the key value in that organization was a fantastically loyal gr group of blue plate customers. And the customers had key relationships with our, the sales and customer support people in the organization. So we had to keep them. So how do you do it? Well. I've already told you, I don't think the best people in the world work for money. So going to them and raising their pay is not going to work. So what we did, and I did it, literally. I went with the guy who was going to lead the business unit. We went to each one of them and he said, you tell me what it is. If we do it, we'll make you successful. Right? We want to retain your customer account. We want you to be successful. What is it we need to do to, to support that? And we took notes, and then we did it. To the extent we were able, we followed up on that. All of those key relationships are in place. That customer base has grown by about 25%. Usually you lose about 25%. In fact, in our acquisition economics, we pro form it in, losing about 15%. It's grown about 25%. All the people we wanted to keep are there. <coughs> Second acquisition, we did the same thing. Who did we want to keep? We bought a company that had an unbelievable record of growth and incredible execution and discipline. And it really was the leaders who set the tone, who had hired the team, who were there. And if we lost those leaders, we were toast. And we had an interesting situation because we had a, had a man who owned 70% of the stock who was going to sell the company. He got a check for $700 million for his interest in the company when we bought it. And you know what? He didn't care whether it was going to be $800 million or $600 million, 
because he was going to give most of it to charity anyway, but he believed that his leadership team had made him rich and he wanted them to be successful. So I literally went to him and I showed him our management <coughs> chart or leadership chart and said, these are the people and this is where they came from. This is the deal that they joined Rock 10 through because most all of us came from acquisitions. And I said, here's the commitment I'll make to you with respect to your leadership team. I said, I won't tell you that they'll get any specific job. I'll just tell you that they'll get the job they deserve. And here's our team, right? And this, this, is, this is the proof, right? Because you don't need, because anybody can say anything they want, but it's real nice if somebody's got a track record. And the guy believed us, sold us his company. We were able to get all six of the people who were the real operational leaders to sign on to long-term agreements with us. And those six people are still there two and a half years later, and that business has done unbelievably well. Now, one of the reasons it worked was when I got to know them, I realized, hey, they're like us, only they're who we really want to be. Like, we're not there yet, but they had exactly the culture we wanted, extreme commitment to performance, incredible desire to be the best company in the industry, incredible desire to be, be respected. And even though they were small, they were very profitable, but by joining us, they could be a lot more successful and a lot more profitable. And the fact is, Every one of them is with us today, and every one of those six people has a better job than they had the day they joined the company. Yeah, so, good. That's terrific. We can do that. I'll just show you a couple of charts. So the answer. Let's go to the tail of the tape, right? So we got some pictures. The deals have worked very well. I'm not getting this thing. Doesn't want to do it anymore. There we go. So here's the numbers that we've posted. This is, this, the blue chart is earnings before interest taxes and depreciation. You can see it's grown somewhat. Earnings per share, we made 50 cents a share uh, in 2004. That was about what we made when we came. We made $6.34 a share last year. That's a significant increase in value. Our margins when I came, I mentioned Rock 10 was kind of a not really great company. We had EBITDA margins of 9%, EBITDA after CapEx of 5%. This is the same chart. Basically, at the end of this period of time, we are the most profitable company in our businesses. Uh, and this is really what I want to talk about. Manufacturing is challenged in the United States because this is stock price return for our peer group. So these are all the people that are pretty much like us in the business. Now, the reason these bars are only this long is you can't go below zero, right? When you lose, when you go bankrupt, <laughs> that's minus 100. So Caristar, Newark Group, Chesapeake, Smurfistone, they've all gone bankrupt. And as you can see, there are really only four companies that have made money in that period of time. This is a 10-year period of time. But actually, if you invested in the stock market on the day I joined Rock 10, in that 10-year period of time, you've got your money plus 11% back. If you bought Rock 10, you have your money plus 304%. So it's a strategy that has worked very well in a challenged industry. Now, I know I've got to quit, but I'm going to show you a couple more charts because I can't stand it. We faced very challenging economic times right, in America. But this is a chart of who's grown and who's not. So in fact, if you look at these bars, you'll see that in the incredible recession, the yellow bar in the United States, when the United States is down, China, India, Indonesia, Australia had significant, really incredible GDP growth. And then if you move over into Europe, very severe depression, very slow growth rates going forward. And if you get over here, really bad circumstances. What is the correlation on this chart. This chart's correlation is the relative freedom of your economy. China today has the freest, least regulated, least taxed economic environment in the world, with the highest growth rate. The United States has a lot of regulatory burdens. We're moving towards Europe. This is where Europe is. Probably the least certain, most sort of crazily regulated economy in the world would be Russia, and that's where they are. Now, Good news is, for all of us, there is, an, there is a recovery undergoing in the United States. So this is industrial, capacity, industrial production and capacity utilization. This is the good news. Things are getting a little bit better. Here is the bad news for all of us. This chart tracks employment in every recession since, but not including the Great Depression. So the top lines show what the change in percentage employment was in all of those recessions, 
1974, 80, 90, 2001, and then ours. So this is a very, very different recession. It's a recession because of what's happened to employment. And that is going to be tough to change. And as you know, unemployment, they say it's 10%, but if you count people who quit looking for jobs, it's much higher. It's 18 or 19%, and I bet everybody in this room, including me, knows people who quit looking. Right, and they're not being reported. So we have a disaster on our hands in terms of employment. And it's worse in manufacturing. And if you look at this number, it's really bad because who's growing? Education's growing. Well, education's a good job and education's important, but it doesn't create value. It's not a wealth creator directly. What else is growing? Leisure and hospitality. Well, that's really cool. There's not a lot of value being created in leisure and hospitality. <laughs> Okay, so all the people, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't want to get funny here. <laughs> government's growing, government's growing 10%, and that's just on our backs. And what's not, right? Retail and trade's down, construction's down, and what's really down? The wealth creator in basically every country in the world manufacture is not. And I believe that it is a tough place to do business in the United States, and we're making it tougher. And if we want to make it better, we need to remove the regulatory burdens, and we need to remove the tax burdens, and we need to free up the domestic economy. Now, you may agree with me, you may not, but I believe we need jobs, and I think that we're, we're really making it tough on ourselves. And for all of us here, uh, I think this is, this is really the driver of what our lives are going to look like over the next five to ten years. Is there anything we know of that's troublesome in this picture? In addition, we're saying, working on those facts saying, well, gosh, what, what is happening that's doing this? All right, well, here's your correlation. This chart's the analog of the one I just showed you. The jobs chart, if you plot the jobs in this recession, and you plot the long-term trend of government debt, they just look, they're just sitting right on top of each other. And this is basically what's happening to the U.S. Deficit, debt, and it's, it's really exploding. And it's a major problem for us because every dollar the government takes out of the economy is a dollar that's basically gone from a productive use. And it is, a, it is a, a very big problem if you're me trying to figure out how am I going to make that 10,000 jobs, 11,000, 12,000, or 13, not five or six. Right. So I wish I had better news on that score. <laughs> but I got a message, or at least I have a passionate belief as to the solution. So again, thank you all very much. We've got, we've got time for questions as a group. And then when people need to leave, I'll just stay for individual questions.